My name is Lauren Branick, and I am one of the co-sponsors of Autism Awareness Club. Um, and just a quick note before we get started about the format for today, um, our panelists will begin by sharing some information that they have prepared for you all. And then we will open up for questions from the audience. So at that time, you can unmute yourself and voice any questions if you feel comfortable with that. Um, otherwise, you can put questions in the chat box and I will be monitoring that um, to voice those questions. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Denise, uh, our other co-sponsor for the club. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Gosh, we're so happy to have you join us. Um, our members are all set and ready to, to share lots of info, good information about autism, as Lauren said. I'm Denise, and I am one of the co-sponsors of the club. Very privileged to be so. Um, we have a great group of students that uh, want to share their experience, strength, and hope with all of you. So um, everything that Lauren said, ditto. I will now pass it over to Matthew Castillo, the president of our club. Take it away, Matthew. Hey guys. Yep. My name is Matthew Castillo. I am the president of the Autism Awareness Club. And it's so nice to meet all of you. And I'm gonna pass it to Dev, who's the vice president. Hi, good morning. Going Matthew. Yep. Yeah, we're gonna, we should all introduce ourselves. The panelists should introduce ourselves. You're gonna introduce yourself, Dev? Yes, I'm Dev Allwine and I, uh, I read a couple segments of the speech. Okay, nice. And we have Teresa Bayetto, who is our good old secretary. Hello, my name is Teresa Bayetto, and I am the secretary of Autism Awareness Club. Now, and also Jackie, Jackie will be our Jackie is our current treasurer of the club. Hi guys, I'm Jackie. I am the treasurer of the Autism Awareness Club as well as a student at MCC. Um, I'm also a registered behavioral technician um, working with kids on the spectrum. So I will be discussing later in this panel um, therapies and treatments to help um, with autism. So yeah, guys, welcome to our big panel. This panel has been in the making since the beginning of 2020. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has been delayed a few times. The original plan for this panel was to hold it in a room on the MCC campus, but we ended up holding this panel through Zoom because of the pandemic. Anyway, it is time to understand autism so you can easily navigate in a complex world. What is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word autism? You might think of the vaccine myth. You might think of the genetics contributed into autism. You might think of the employment issues attached to having autism. Or you might think of the false stereotypes associated with autism. Well, before we dive into all of this information, we need, first need to know what autism is. Autism or an autism spectrum disorder is a developmental disorder of variable severity that is characterized by difficulty in social interaction and communication and by restricted or repetitive patterns of thought and behavior. Autism is a complicated disability because like any disability, there's a spectrum on how differs and different each person with autism is. According to the CDC, autism affects an estimated 154 children in the US today. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, it's you, oh. Deb. Yeah. Up next, genetics and common comorbidities. Researchers disagree on what contributes to autism, whether it's genes or environment, perhaps both. First, let's be clear, there is no such thing as an 
autism gene. Scientists have come up with 65 genes that might have a strong link to autism and 200 others with weaker ties. Although experts think that there is a definite role of genetics, the answer is not that easy as genetics do not account for all autism risk. Other theories include environmental risks such as exposure to material immune response in the womb or complications during birth. It has also been reported that autism has a tendency to run in families, but the inheritance pattern is not known yet. To add to the individual, di individual differences in people with autism, there are other psychiatric problems that are not associated with autism, but people who are autistic may also deal with, such as depression, obsessive compulsive, compulsive disorder, and eating disorder. Some common comorbidities. 40 to 60% have severe anxiety. 50 to 90% have OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. 30 to 40% have, have a chronic mood disorder. 20 to 30% have Down syndrome. Uh, 25 to 40% have Fragile X syndrome. 10 to 25% have a metabolic disorder. 30 to 40% have an intellectual disability. 25 to 35% have epilepsy. Five to, and five to 15% have a speech impediment. Thank you, Deb. Now we'll turn it back to Matthew. All right. This next part is myths and misconceptions. There are many myths and controversies that surround autism. Here, we will just cover a few. Not all people act like the character from the movie Raid Man. They're, they are not all savage who can do complicated math in their head. Another myth that exists is that autism and ADHD is the same thing. They are not. ADHD affects attention, hyperactivity, and concentration, while autism is a complex disability that's more likely to affect behavior. The, mis the misconception is that people with autism do not feel emotions is totally the opposite, totally the opposite. And the fact they have, that they have often have heightened sensitivity to their own and others' emotions. Many people are under the misconception that autism is a childhood condition that can be outgrown or cured. Where therapy can help with social interaction, it does not mean that it's cured. There are many different types of treatments that can help people with learning skills and reduce behavioral patch impacts, which, impacts which Jackie will be discussing later. Another myth is that people with autism are antisocial. While it is true that people with autism have different and often misunderstood ways of showing interests, or affection, they're still like anyone else to desire to make friends. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much for sharing. Teresa, Teresa will now be telling us about transition to adulthood and employment issues. Transitions can be quite difficult for autistic people. They usually rely on routines to socially get to where they want to be and lifestyle changes can be uncomfortable for them. The best tool autistic people have is preparatory activities. Life starts at the home environment, preschool, and kindergarten. One way autistic children can improve their independence is to find help from educational programs in pursuing their education with support from their families and teachers. 
when autistic children move to middle school and high school, they face physical and emotional challenges of puberty. They may want to work together with their families to address their way to college. Most autistic college students would choose to pursue higher education that can help them achieve degrees with lots of practice on the skills they need to enhance adulthood. There are many opportunities available for them if autistic young adults still struggle with their childhood behaviors. Go to a college where it provides resources to special needs students, or go to a program that is available in offering social, academic, career, and life skills for post-secondary educational success. In addition to the transition to college, the transition to employment can also be difficult for individuals with autism. Because of the many misconceptions associated with autism, employers may have low expectations and think that people with autism are incapable of performing work tasks and avoid hiring them. Statistics show that 35% of people with autism are unemployed after finishing education. 10% receive employment support, and only 19.3% participate in the labor force. Most adults with autism are unemployed because they have symptoms that can be a barrier to interviewing, managing physical requirements, and or engaging with teams and groups. Other challenges that can be critical barriers to employment include social anxiety, sensory challenges, difficulty handling criticism, and unwillingness to share or collaborate. While there are programs for people with disabilities, these programs are not always designed with autism spectrum disorder in mind. Employment considerations for people with autism spectrum disorder should include self-directed work and selecting jobs that relate to their interests and abilities. To help decide their career choices, school counselors can use tools including vocational and aptitude tests. The student's vision can be used to create part of the transition plan that include training, internship, and vocational skills, making it easier to get opportunities for employment. There are challenges that will still need to be dealt with as a person's abilities are not always enough to get a good job. Understanding strengths and challenges are important to transition and the job search process. It's possible to set an autistic individual up for success, but it takes planning and work. Thank you so much, Teresa. Lots of great information so far from our panel members. And now we'll move on to Jackie. All right, as Matthew mentions before, autism is not curable, but there are many treatments and therapies available for those living on the spectrum. These approaches can help improve social interactions, communication abilities, coping skills, and overall help improving skills with extra help in specific areas. First, we have applied behavioral analysis, also known as ABA therapy. This therapy is a type of therapy that focuses on the behaviors of an individual. This therapy is based on scientific methods and data collected to create individual interventions customized specifically to each person's needs. The approach focuses on the use of rewards to reinforce positive behaviors and is known for intense training for parents and caregivers as well. ABA may include focus on increasing communication, social skills, personal care and schoolwork while decreasing maladaptive behaviors to allow an individual to succeed in today's society. Studies show children who receive early intensive ABA can make big and lasting gains as well as immense improvements for individuals who are older. There's also occupational therapy, also known as OT. This involves activities that specifically involve fine motor skills. This could range from working on something like buttoning a shirt, pouring ingredients for a recipe, or even something as basic as writing skills. Occupational therapy also focuses on sensory input, 
allowing decrease in anxiety, stimulating behaviors, and increases focus. Speech therapy, also known as ST, offers, offers opportunities to learn not only how to speak, but also help those who do speak to engage in conversations and interactions with others. This therapy can also benefit those who lack eye contact, taking turns in conversation, and using also understanding gestures and body language from others. Social skills class is also very popular. Um, this is available for individuals on the spectrum and is a great way to practice communication skills in a structured and control in, controlled environment with the support of professionals. Cognitive behavioral therapy, also known as CBT, is a form of psychological treatment that has been demonstrated to be effective for a range of emotional problems. These problems may include depression, anxiety, disorders, alcohol or drug use problems, marital problems, eating disorders, and several and severe mental illnesses. In many studies, CBT has been demonstrated to be as effective as or more effective than other forms of psychological therapy or psychiatric medications. With no person on the spectrum being alike, all therapies discussed above involve personalized plans and interventions specifically designed for each individual in order to meet their needs. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you so much. Now we will pass it back to Deb for some information on vaccine controversy. We've all, we've all heard that myth of vaccines causing autism autism, well, the origin of the vaccine superstition started with Andrew Wakefield, a former British pediatrician. He published The Lancelot Autism Fraud, fraud in 1998. Only 12 subjects were studied and autistic-like behaviors were provoked by intentional fear exposure and parents were manipulated. Following studies could not display the same. 19% of Americans oppose vaccinations. That is more than 62 million and 500,000 people. Of that 19%, 65%, more than 42,380,000 people claim vaccines cause autism. Thank you, Deb. Right. Thank you for that uh, clarifying information. And now we're at the point where Teresa will wrap things up with a closing statement before we open it up to everyone for um, introductions of yourself, if you'd like to share, and any questions for our panel. Go ahead, Teresa. As you can see, autism is complex, and by assuming falsehoods, it can lead to unemployment, judgment, and other unfair treatment. Rather, we should take the time to get to know each person with autism, like anyone else. As the T once said, you meet one person with autism. You've met one person with autism. Thank you, Teresa. Do we want to share with the group who Ty, the quote at the end, uh, who Ty is? Go ahead. Yeah, well, yeah. So this Ty Vinson was a former president of the Autism Club. He was the I think the first president of the autism club. And then we had Sidra, who was the next president. And now, currently, I am the one holding the position for now. Yeah. Excellent. Matthew, I know you also wanted to mention, um, give a mention of the Temple, Dr. Temple Grandin's book that you said was impactful to you. Did you want to? Mention that, I have a copy here to show the audience. Yeah, so 
Yeah, since one of our topics involved the trans autistic people having a hard time transitioning to adulthood, and believe me, it's yeah, it that this that topic describes my life. Yeah, we all I learned of a book called The Loving Push by Temple Grandin that was told to me by my psychologist. That's one that I one that I see for a long time. And yeah, he told me about the book and I thought this would be perfect to introduce to everyone in the, in the panel. So yeah. Temple Grandin. What is it, Dev? Temple Grandin is a woman. On, Temple Grandin is a woman on the autism spectrum. She's an animal scientist. Yes, she teaches, I believe, at, at uh, Col one of the Colorado State Universities. Um, and she speaks, she's a, a very active speaker on the circuit coming to, I saw her at Northern Illinois University a couple years ago. She's written several books, um, as Teresa mentioned, about animal science. And this book that Matthew referred to, which Matthew is not the only individual that I've heard say, that describes me or a parent that says, this describes my son or daughter, my child. Um, but it's, it's a handbook, it's, it's entitled The Loving Push, How Parents and Professionals Can Help Spectrum Kids Become Successful Adults. So um, it's a powerful book. I just wanna mention, yeah. Yeah, I feel like that book could be helpful to some of us in the club because, yeah, some of us are having a hard time trying to figure out what to do after during our adulthood these days. We get hard, it's a hard time trying to find jobs and other things to have a great future. And yeah, it describes my life and it describes some of the many people in the, the, club yeah anything to yes. say Deb? it took me 10 years to find it i said yes it took me 10 years to find my major yeah that's that's interesting um Hi, I'm Lily O'Connell from Access and Disability Services. And I was wondering, I think people might be curious about your majors and the things you guys are pursuing. Because um, I know we have some incoming students um, here today. And so I think it, they'd be really interested in knowing what academic programs you guys are all pursuing. Well, first I was studying early childhood education that was not my thing, it turned out. Then I switched to graphic design. I had a, it turns out I changed that because of a couple teachers I didn't like. So then I was just going for the general studies. Or, and so then I was do, I got a degree in general studies and a certificate in graphic design. And now I am taking classes for horticulture, mostly the time. Uh, you want me to answer or? Yes, you can please. answer, DJ. DJ. Introduce oh. yourself, DJ. Hi, I'm DJ. I just, uh, I just graduated from college last uh, late 2019 before the pandemic i just got the uh i've been studying for computer arts and animation for a long time and also known for painting i got the art certificates and the uh animation and the degree so i've been studying that for a while yep dj was yeah a former member before he graduated but he still stays in touch with us and uh autism club yeah dj do you have any of your paintings on hand that you can show the audience um he's super talented with his artistic abilities let me and see I think uh, the audience would love to see 
your artwork. Let me make sure. I don't know how close this. I'm between, using my phone. So um. And there is a common correlation between autism spectrum disorders and creativity. Yeah, this proves that not all autistic people are good at math and sciences. There are also autistic people who are really good artists. Teresa and Matthew, do you want to share your programs while DJ's looking for some paintings? Absolutely, we could. What do you mean okay. by programs? I think what she means Studies, is major. the programs that you're graduate with degrees. The degrees yeah. that you're I'm not sure. I'm just mostly uh, yes. going. I'm just mostly wanting to. Yeah, mostly trying to go for digital media, but mostly sometimes I do like to go. I just take other classes just because, I don't know. Well, I think it's good to explore other areas. Yeah. Teresa, you were muted if you were trying to share your, your program of study. Go ahead. All right, all right. The programs I'm in right now are Associates in Arts and Associates in Science. I'm also be graduating with both Associates in Arts this up this May and Associates in Science in the fall of this year or the spring of next year. As for the Associates in Applied Sciences, I may study a bit of everything a bit of different fields, like health and fitness, graphic arts, accounting, robotics, any kind of field, any kind of field study, field studies, field of study, yeah. Excellent, thank you, Teresa. We've got, oh my gosh, we've got DJ's, one of his paintings. DJ, would you like to describe that painting? Yeah, I just chose one of my uh, friends to do a painting of our selfies we did last year. So <laughs> it's got my first few attempts. So here's what I got. These are the club. Who? What selfies are these, DJ? Who's uh, we were at the bowling last year before the pandemic. Just us together, Teresa and them. The club members, right? Yeah. Okay. And this is the uh, one from the downtown Crystal Light last year. Yep. Also. Yes. And I want to give a mention, speaking of art, that is excellent, DJ. And, and I love how you kept that, it, that memory alive when um, several of you got together and went downtown Crystal Lake and had a fun afternoon together. Um, Teresa, our secretary of our club, is the artist of the flyer that you received. So that's, uh, there's another example of, of great artwork. Thank you both, Teresa and DJ. Yo, well, and time. DJ, can you show that again? Uh, yeah. Some more of it um, this time. This one? Um, on the far right, can you move it over a little? Yeah. Is a member named Sidra, she is currently not here, but she co-wrote the script. Yeah. Well, she was last year at the time, so. Just want to mention yes. a few of the questions that have popped up in the chat. Um, someone did ask what the different types of eating disorders are that we had mentioned as comorbidities. Um, Teresa did mention that they had found anorexia and bulimia did fall into those uh, comorbidities. Um, and then Picky Graham... Eating. Yes. And then Bram asked a question picky, about incredibly picky. Uh, Bram asked a question about pe saying people with autism versus autism. Oh. Did you have something to say, Dev? Yeah, I was saying picky eating, aka selective eating disorder, though it is not officially recognized. Sure. So there's some I can some other probably and that is due to sensory reasons. 
And I can probably name all my main dishes on my 10 fingers. Yeah, so selective eating in addition to those eating disorders. Um, and then Bram asked a question um, about saying people with autism versus autistic people. So person first language. Um, and I wonder if any panelists wanted to speak to that question. Do you care if people say, if that could say autistic individual versus individual with autism? And I told him in the chat that autistic people and people with autism are the same thing. I do have something to say with that. Um, with my training, when I, six years ago, when I started as a registered behavioral technician, um, trainers made it very clear um, that the proper way is to say, um, instead of saying autistic person, you would say a person living with autism, specifically because autism does not define a person. Good point, Jackie. And, yeah. I was, and I later put in the chat that that we, we, we must not label any kind of person because that could be discriminating to others. So I'm looking at Allison's question um, in the in the chat, and I think everyone in club should give an answer to that. Yeah, do you want me to read it out, Dev? Yes. So Allison asked, as a parent to a nine-year-old autistic child, looking back on your own childhood, what is the one piece of advice you would give to your own parents? Be aware of the sensory issues heightened sensory in mo most areas, textures, what the child likes to wear, um, tasting as said, volume, lighting, be aware of that stuff because they will come, because there is something called a sensory overload and some, someone with that kind of sensory just shuts down and goes away from whatever social activity is going on. I know if your yeah. child is being the uh, being more social or something at school or not, so that could be one of the signs. So with my therapy, and I would like everyone in the club to let me know if this would benefit you, um, a lot of times we offer options. So giving someone on the spectrum options, for example, something to wear, lay out four options and let them choose has also helped a lot with making decisions and um, letting the person feel like they do have a choice. What do you guys think as far as that? in regards to having options of things opposed to saying you have to wear this today. I think this is very empowering. In addition, I would advise the nine-year-old to be the best version of yourself without even thinking that, that you have to mask the symptoms of autism. Because masking well, in turn I would say can cause like mood issues and mental issues later in life. I would say let your you should let your child pick out their outfit as long as it's um, socially appropriate they should have a choice. I just want to say I have to say Whitney looks like yeah, we you have a great idea if we can use we can our club could use the word acceptance, autism acceptance club. Do you prefer the word acceptance or the word awareness? Yeah, I think both words are okay, but it looks like Dev may be right that acceptance may be better, that we could rename our club Aut autism acceptance club. I agree, Matthew. Also, yes. yeah, we will have to you work on that next year. Oh, yeah, just want to say next semester. Yeah, Teresa has been wondering. I want to say Teresa has been wondering about 
what causes autism and the difference between men who get autism and females. Yeah. Teresa has been wondering that. We've been discussing it in the group chat and she's been wondering a lot. Anybody could answer if possible? I don't know. Yeah, I'd say, why do we really have to know the different, um, the different causes if it's not curable? Why do we really have to know? Yeah, I don't know. So we could I mean, can't we embrace ourselves? I mean, what about embracing yourself? That's what I mean. It's important to know more about the causes of autism and the differences they may represent if both genders, despite having the same severity of symptoms, this is because we got to discover ourselves if we want to be better off in life. Besides, I had thought about like, what causes autism in men and women? And I had thought about in the past that men with autism tend, yeah, male autism tends to be more towards genetics and Female autism may be genetic as well, but female autism, on the other hand, may be skewed towards more like environmental triggers. If if I could say something on that, I'd be happy to. Um, Go so, ahead. Uh, uh, hi, everybody. My name is Robin Deke. I'm a psychology instructor here. Um, and, and honestly, I think the panel has been great. Hey, Dev, it's good to see you again. And, um, uh, you know, one thing, you know, we I think one of the panelists said earlier, we really don't know uh, exact causes of, of autism, there is a, a, a very high percentage of genetic um, association and, and correlation. Um, and But one of the things that you guys were asking about is there is a higher rate for males than females of autism. Um, and one of the theories behind that is, and I think, Dev, I think you may have uh, actually brought this up, that fragile X syndrome, um, so that that is a disorder in which there is um, a mutation, uh, a kind of uh, brokenness to the X chromosome. Um, and uh, females have two X chromosomes. And so if there is a kind of um, a damage to one of the X chromosomes, the other X chromosome can actually help and kind of supersede that and kind of help fix that, um, whereas males have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. So if that X chromosome has that mutation and it has that damage, the Y can't help that X chromosome. Um, and that's one of the reasons why um, with Fragile X, you, you, you do see um, various um, situations like autism where um, you have a little bit more male dominated. There's more males have autism than, than females. Um, uh, but but honestly, you know, the, the, the research and the science just continues to look at the genetics. Um, and you're right, there's no one specific genetic um, gene right now. Um, but, you know, the research and science, and science continues to look at environmental factors as well. Um, but it's really hard to say. And just like you have all said, everybody's so different. Um, and, and there's no one, um, you know, you meet one person with autism, you've met one person. Um, and I think, you know, that's kind of where we're at in regards to what the exact causes of autism are. Now, um, if I could just ask a really quick question, one of the things I do here is uh, I'm a faculty development chair, which means I help faculty and um, try and bring um, topics and various uh, topics of interest for the classroom. So I would really love to ask the panel what is one thing that you wish you, your instructor in the classroom would know about autism or, or you, or something that we could do um, that maybe you didn't share with your instructor during a class? But if you could, what's something that you think would help teachers help you in the classroom? Not everyone with autism is the same. Um, I am affected because, because um, autism is neurological and one of the common comorbidities is epilepsy, in which I have, um, there is 
the memory effect is affected. And so a note taker is usually needed. And autism affects both sexes. Even though in the past, males were diagnosed with autism because the doctors back in the mid 20th century, they focused on research on males. Well, they include, they exclude females in the autism spectrum. Consider this, I'm a female with autism. And females with autism, I hope they get diagnosed at the same rate. There's one thing I know about like, me being female on the autism spectrum is very isolating since women on the spectrum in the past were far more likely to mask the symptoms when they're children in which I didn't when I was a child. And the diagnostic criteria was based on the research on boys, which was very discriminating against girls on the autism spectrum. They don't think that female autism exists in which it does exist but it was, but it was not greenlit until now. Now that more and more females are getting diagnosed with autism, like I was diagnosed with autism as a child, they came off to in their teens because of masking, which isn't a good thing. Well, I hopefully that doctors could change their research, the makeup of the research and diagnostic criteria to screen girls in their toddler years and they may have autism to get diagnosed with autism earlier. So they can get the services. This is just like boys when the past. I hope they get services and they get the treatment they need in, in earlier life to, to accept themselves in the future. That's right. Yeah. Not to mention, I just... I talked with my the club group chat and they also mentioned dating and how I think it's how hard it could be for people with autism, dating and stuff. And I thought about dating and marriage. That comes from the social yeah, that comes from the social awkwardness. And the social awkwardness is on both ends. Some of us incredibly shy, some of us talking way too much, like me. Hi, this Sorry. is Lil this is Lily again. Um, on the topic of dating, um, you know, we're we're home a lot, watching more TV than I'm I want to watch. But um, on Netflix, there's a couple of really good series that address that. One is a, a is real people, and it's called Dating on the Spectrum. And it's, it's uh, young adults with autism who are, you know, learning how to date and, and set up relationships. And then the other one is, a, is more of a fiction. It's a show, you know, show. It's not like a reality show. And that's called Atypical. And it's about young adults with autism. And it, again, it touches on some of these issues that you guys are talking about. And I've, I've just found both shows really good, um, really great depictions with real practical uh, information and stuff. I, I really recommend them for anybody. That's nice, Lily. Yes. Yeah, so we, you know, the, everything. It's encompassing everything. All the things that any person deals with in their life. The social issues we've talked about. The medical issues. Um, thank you, Robin, for asking about uh, pointers for mm -hmm. um, faculty. Matthew, did you want to add anything? to Robin's question about uh, what you would like your instructors to know? I don't think so. I think it's just mostly tell them your, uh, the accommodations that you give them for your, for your class should be enough to tell them. I have, I have a, a suggestion. Um, after all my decades and decades of this. Um, and I think you guys will agree. It, it helps to have really explicit instructions for things, wouldn't you say? Like, you know, they tell you exactly what they want in the paper, how many pages they need, things like that, right? Grading rubrics and things like that. I think that that can be really helpful um, and having good schedules in the syllabus and good just good syllabi in general where you can go and find the information that you need. 
you know, I think that that helps. So using Canvas and um, having a good organized Canvas site that's got all the information that a student needs to complete their work really can relieve the stress if you know where it is and where to find it. And then again, the clearer and more specific the instructions, I think that helps a lot too to know exactly what the teacher wants. So you, you, know, what, you know that you're doing the right thing. Oh, okay, nice. Oh, Jen Zelinsky has something to ask. Is there anything specific you would like law enforcement professionals to know while interacting with people that have intellectual or developmental disabilities? Another question. Anybody? Don't ask too many questions. If, you, if you're if you going to question someone involved in something, don't ask too many questions all at once. Right. And maybe give them time to answer, to process it, you know, give them to give legs in time, lapses so that they can process things. And also, I think it's important to remember that not everybody's verbal. You know, that sometimes there are students who don't speak or don't speak well, especially if they're upset and to realize that that's not, they're not ignoring you or, you know, not speaking to you. They're, they have trouble speaking. And so maybe um, understanding that and that it might limit their responses, I think is important for law enforcement too. Yeah. And, to and to try and de-escalate the situation, right? To calm everybody down. I think is important when you're upset to have a law, a, a police officer would help you calm down uh, in this situation. Well, yeah, I had true. that experience my first year of college where I was, well, my mood was heightened when I was making mistakes involving the USB drive from a 2D class. Well, well, I have trouble with emotions. I had some emotional immaturity out loud. And then the police, and I was involved with the police uh, out a couple of hours later. And I, in my interaction with the police, helped me deal with the real world more often. Since I was escorting myself into some fancy world when I was younger. Okay. And it helped me adult to where I get to be now after police and after a couple of police interactions. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. You know, I do want to mention, and, and, and I won't call the individual out. I know there's someone attending our, um, our event today that I attended a webinar by this individual uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And there was uh, a portion on there that affected me. There was a presentation part that affected me so profoundly. And it ties into what Dev said. Be patient. Don't throw too many questions at us. And so, um, Officer Jen, thank you for speaking up because um, the patience is what, what hit me. It's not that individuals with autism are not hearing what you're saying or understanding what anyone is saying, anyone, but in a situation out in society, if when we're out in society, you know, our police officers are our there to help us in society, to not ask too many questions at once. And if we're not, if this, the individual isn't responding, it's not because they're being um, disrespectful. They, they, it's too much if they're overwhelmed. Um, and Matthew, would you like to share what our recent, um, we, we placed a recent order for something that we feel will be helpful um, we'd like to get this, the students in our club as well as we want to pass them out to individuals. I don't know what it is. I'm sorry. What is it? Oh, the, the cards, the uh, identification cards. We recently ordered um, identification cards that someone would carry in their wallet or as an ID that states that they have autism. I have autism. And I think, uh, Officer Jen, that's usually the first request is do you have identification and to to be able to hand that to an officer that that would be so helpful there's some helpful tips on the card um if you want to speak officer jen and ask about anything more yeah i just i want to say first of all thank you guys so much for including me um this is wonderful and i want everybody here to know that uh, the crystal lake police department 
really, really, really wants to make it safe for all of our community members, especially people um, that have developmental and intellectual disabilities. So we take this very, very seriously. And um, our training is really extensive and it's really, really, really important to us. And, 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 you know, not only for members of our community, but we interact with people outside of our community every day, right? And typically when we go to calls, um, unfortunately, we are meeting people most likely on one of the worst days of their life, right? Um, so it's important to, to take all things into consideration, not only emotions, but also um, disabilities that someone may, may have. So um, thank you guys. This is really, really helpful. I'm excited to you know, share this with the rest of the police department and, um, um, Jen, uh, this is Lily O'Connell again, and I had a question. Uh, coincidentally, I was watching the news last night, and they were talking about how local police departments maintain databases for for people with disabilities. Yeah. Um, so, in order to, if you know, if they if they get caught in a difficult situation, they know more about the person. Yeah, perhaps absolutely. things like if they're not verbal or things like that. Would you recommend that our students who are concerned about this contact their local police department to kind of get in their database so that if something happens, they already know about them? Absolutely. So typically, um, you know, for us as a as a patrol officer, so I was a mental health clinician for ten years. Mm -hmm. and then I, I jumped over to um, being a police officer. So I'm a rookie, I've been on for a year and a half and I can tell you when dispatch gives us a call and it's what we call a hot call, right? We're going lights and sirens because um, we don't have a lot of information. It's just a, a domestic dispute between a mother and a son and, and things are physical. That obviously puts us you know, on our, our the edge of our seat. Um, so, the more information dispatch has to provide to our officers, the better we are when we show up, absolutely. Um, so uh, the Chris Lake Police Department and McHenry County does have a, a program where you can contact your local police department to disclose any mental health um, issues or developmental intellectual disabilities that someone in your household may have. And um, if we are called to that household dispatch, um, is to let officers responding know. So absolutely, that again, as a as a clinician and a police officer, that's so helpful. And 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 I would uh, also extend that to people with sensory issues, if absolutely. they're blind or they're deaf. I absolutely. think that's very important for for law enforcement to know if the person can't hear them, absolutely. you know, or, or doesn't yeah. speak or whatever. Or sometimes, you know, might be touching more. A person who's hard of hearing or deaf might be used to touching people. And, you know, a police officer might see that as aggression. So, you know, having this information just makes everybody safer, I think. Absolutely. I agree. Oh, can I mention? Go ahead, Matthew. I, I brought in a few questions that we mentioned. We mentioned for our script that we part of our, that was part of our script. Yes. One of them being, what, what was the transition like for students with autism that go to college? For me, I just want to say, Back, back in 2014, the year I graduated, I, I had a lot of trouble trying to adjust to post-graduation life as I, okay, see a Dev. Okay, yeah, there was, yeah, I had a lot of trouble transitioning from post-high school life as I did want to still try to go back to high school and stuff and do some of the activities there. I just wasn't used to, at the time, uh, moving forward from, I wasn't used to at the time, using going forward from high school to college, and it was just pretty hard for me to try to adjust. But yep, seven years from now, I'm already I already adjusted, and now I'm getting involved in a few awesome clubs in this MCC. In MCC, what about you, Teresa? What was it like? for the transitioning from high school to college? Well, I had a huge personal battle when I was in high school. There was a battle between my family and Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans is for me to go to Prairie Ridge and take lots of special education courses. Well, my family supports me to go to a general education college which is Vicarikai College. And high school 
Kusek South principal, Mr. Boberg, helped me transition out of the special education I would, I just want to step in for a second. College. What? Teresa, I would, I would recommend that you not mention people's exact names. Okay. 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 And so I, and I want to go to Makaya College just to be more neurotypical. And I got to get into more and more general educational courses. So I want to have to pass as special needs. Because me, myself, I, special needs kind of drains me down. So I want to be general, general education. I'll be better off. I would obtain new skills, new skills coming from like general education to help me be more successful, be more mature than ever. Okay. Thank you guys. I just want to be conscious of time. It's about 10 57. Um, and we have mentioned most of the questions in the chat. I think a lot of our panelists are monitoring the chat as well. I do just want to bring up um, Ginger did ask if it is more prevalent now or if it just was misdiagnosed in the past. Um, and I think Bram mentioned probably a little bit of both, um, which I think we mentioned in our research as well. And then also someone mentioned that uh, the DSM also got rid of Asperger syndrome, which was typically diagnosed um, for high functioning autism. Um, and now it all falls on the autism spectrum disorder, which someone mentioned as well. All right, I gotta go. Okay, see ya DJ. Bye, Bye DJ. Maybe, you know, maybe I'll, we'll try to quickly ask one more, mention one more question. Yeah, if people can stay on, we can stay around and answer questions, definitely. Go ahead, Matthew. I'm trying to think of what to say. I'll think I'll see number five. How does autism affect our identity? I don't know. It doesn't affect myself too much, but it seems to affect Teresa as how I, when I we talked in the group chat. Teresa? All right. Want to well, mention about how. People with autism have great identity issues. Many, many people with autism, I repeat, I repeat. In other words, autistic people have greater identity issues that may not fit in. They may not fit into what it means to be someone they're not, something like that. For example, girls with autism, they're misdiagnosed because a lot of doctors think that they're really good at hiding their symptoms. And so this gives the opportunity for girls to be someone they're not, which lowers their self-esteem, which affects their identity. They may have like hidden identity or they believe that their identity, real identity doesn't exist. Their real identity may be socially unacceptable to society, which, also, which means they may have higher suicidal thoughts. And they may have identity problems too throughout their lives. And also like, for example, boys with autism spectrum, um, they may not fit into what it means to be a man or like that. So they have to be more aware of autism acceptance. Autism acceptance means it's okay for them to be different, meaning that women and men that are autism spectrum can be more gender varied or they may have, they may be LGBTQ, or they may have both gender expressions. They have a mix of femininity and masculinity or whatnot. Not to mention, Teresa also mentioned about transitioning to the other gender. Like, yeah, she feels like she might become a guy, something like that. No, I'm, no, no, no. I don't think we should go there, Matthew. We can't mention about that. That's, oh. Sorry. Kinda scares everybody. Sorry. Yeah. We always want to remember that, you know, self-disclosure is everybody's right. So they, they tell their own stories, tell oh. their own secrets. Um, Sorry, um, I didn't meet the... No, it's know. okay. We make, we do it. We all do it sometimes, right? And Lillian, I apologize that I mentioned unfamiliar spectators earlier mm -hmm. in the position process. I'm sorry mm -hmm. about that. No, and, and the only reason I told you is just one of those tips. You know, we teachers, we're always throwing out tips when we see a chance to teach you something. That's so smart. That's what that was. 
and Absolutely. that enhances self-discipline. Yes, it does. If we're and, not and keeps you, and keeps you out of trouble. Yeah, if we're not aware, <laughs> we can't make adjustments. And I keep hearing the same word come up. So I think I like the idea of considering maybe an adaption to our club name, the word acceptance. And um, I will name I without disclosing too much. We the club. We are working on on that acceptance. We're we're bringing in. Um, information and individuals that have helped us with that. So um, I know I need that for myself as well. Um, Megan, and I want to ask one thing to Megan if she's still there. Megan, you there? I'm still here, yeah. Where, where is this recording for the panel going to be saved? Where are you going to save this recording? Yes, so I will have the recording um, transition into a YouTube link. That way we don't lose it because it'll self-delete uh, if I don't. And once we have that YouTube link, um, I'll share it with Denise and Lauren and Lily, and we can decide where we want to post it. Sounds good. Yeah. Here, job, I'll, re everybody. I'll restate the transition. Either I go to a high school, I have two options. Either I go to Prairie Ridge to take a lot of special education courses, and be a janitor or go to a general education community college and then transition to a university to gain independent skills. I chose McCary High College and do and take a lot all general educational courses. Mm -hmm. Would and you recommend MCC to other students? Absolutely. It's a yes, great gonna... educational center. It it gives a McCary High College gives opportunity for students with all disabilities to outgrow their special needs, to outgrow their special educational assets and gain general educational skills and to make them more like their best normal. So they could be independent, it could be successful mm -hmm. life. We didn't even pay her to say that. No, we didn't at all. <laughs> I was gonna say thank you, Teresa. I love that, they're, I love that they're best normal. I live it's, all it's the way. It's a goal for all of us, isn't it? Yeah, I live, I live, I live, I'm trying to restate my tradition process from high school to college. I chose to restate it because I made a lot of mistakes the first time I tried to speak up. Now this is my second attempt to speak it up. Yeah, I live all the way by Joliet, and I've been to like Kankakee College and Joliet Junior College, and they were like really bad with their disability service. I'll be moving up to McHenry County in a few months or sometime this year or next year. And this college is awesome with their disability services. I would also like to add to that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I am a returning student after taking about eight years off right out of high school. I did attend another college. Um, I, am, I do not have autism, but I do have a learning disability, ADD and ADHD. Um, and my experience here at MCC has been amazing. It's really allowed me to succeed um, and much, much better than the other college that I attended. Yeah, much definitely. They much definitely better. accommodate you very well. They're very understanding, um, very good with communication. And I've had a great experience this past year and a half after returning. Mm -hmm. I appreciate nice to this. Hear, Jackie. Yes, it's wonderful to hear it, especially from where I'm sitting. I just have a, a quick question. How many of you guys work with our tutors? I, t I work with a uh, hunter. Hunter's okay. awesome. Me too. I work with Hunter well. too. For, yeah, I work with, I also work with David, David Dobrin mm -hmm. for my class. I just check in with him once a week because I'm already doing great in the class. Because mine's Yeah, I work with awesome. math tutors, psychology tutors. Um, and I believe those are the two. Executive functioning? Yes. Uh, yes, Denise is my executive functioning yeah. tutor. Mm -hmm. I like to consider her a friend though. Yeah. I do too. I do too. Um, you know, executive functioning tutoring, some people who are listening who don't know about MCC might be curious as to what that is. Uh, they kind of understand math tutoring and psychology tutoring. Can anybody kind of explain it to somebody else what executive functioning tutoring is? So I was never given that opportunity to have an executive functioning tutor um, okay. throughout my whole school. 
Um, so MCC is the first place that I took up that opportunity. Um, and pretty much she just makes you accountable for your stuff. She reminds you of things, um, lots of reminders, works with you, kind of gives you resources on who to contact um, when you're unsure. It, she's like the go-to if you have questions. Mm -hmm. If she can answer them, she will. If not, she'll know exactly who to direct you to, um, to best fit your experience with school. Great. And all of these mentions of about MCC, well, I love MCC. Um, and all of these mentions from students uh, are so great to hear. I would also like to add equally, if not more, I, I consider it a privilege and an honor to have all of any, all of you, each individual um, work with you as students, to have you here as our students. Because as I, I say all the time, you are the reason we are here. Mm -hmm. We are, you know, you're not here for us to, for, you're not here to, to help us. We help each other, but you are the reason that we are here and why we have the honor to come through the door every day. So thank you to all of you. I'm taking like office skills management, which is like Microsoft Office Suites. And I took that same class at Juliet Junior College and failed. And I couldn't figure out why. And then like, and I went to this college, she put out videos on how to do the assignments. And the book was so easy. And like book was like easy to follow. It was just awesome. So it's a 180. Well, thank you so much for answering my questions because I do use your information to make decisions. Yeah. And I'm also familiar to executive functioning. I had tutors in um, MCC before. I had tutors in history, English, and also with helping to develop my own scope of self with like, I meet with Denise every Friday this semester, usually. And we go over everything pretty much. And, and do you find that helpful, Teresa? Absolutely. I find right. tutoring helpful. I, I find tutoring helpful. Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot, I forgot to mention, I had tutoring for math too. So things I had struggled with the most. Mm -hmm. And this helps me gain some skills a bit. I still have a long way to go on the skills. Yeah, at Kankakee College, I was sick with a chronic illness I have. And they wanted me to like come in and finish my lab because I was hospitalized. And they wanted me to come in after I was hospitalized and finish the lab, even though it's in my combination for extended test time and something like that. And like, I couldn't drop the class. So I was just like, okay, I'll just leave the class. It's a loss for me. Like, I couldn't do anything about it. I hope you feel better now, Jordan. I do. It's, I don't That's feel any awesome. stress or in this college. Sorry to yes. hear that, Jordan. Yeah. Well, hopefully you're having a great experience here at MCC. I know. I, I'm taking online classes, which are like awesome. The online classes are amazing. I agree, Jordan. Um, I agree, Jordan. Online classes helps us better yeah. become better at dealing with technological issues. Yeah, I really think all of your experiences have just spoken to our staff here and most mostly our faculty here. There, there's some of them who have joined us today and we're so lucky to have them. Um, I know we've run over about 10 minutes and I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today and for giving us some time, extra time to chat. Um, and answer questions. If anyone has anything additional, I'm sure our panelists will be happy to answer, um, but please feel we can wrap it up at this time. I know we've we've gone over. And I just wanna say thank you guys. And I'm so impressed and so proud of all that you've done here. This was a terrific event full of some really, really good, strong information. So yeah. thank you for sharing it with us. And I gotta run, I'm late as always. <laughs> <laughs>
Bye-bye. Bye. 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 I just want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, I, I'm so glad we could finally have this after yeah. so many delays of the panel because of the COVID-19 pandemic. I just hope everybody's hoping to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Yeah. So hopefully we can, we can go back to, to in-person classes. I had to have some stuff come up. I had to, I have to hold off on my vaccine for a while. But yeah, I'm just hoping we can yeah. go back to in-person yeah. classes and we have less, less, res less COVID restrictions around the MCC campus. Yeah. All right. I don't think we're done yet. So we have a couple of questions that have been unanswered. So what are some of the social life implications for students? I think we'll answer them.